Let's talk a little bit about electrostatics. Imagine the following situation. You are walking home, frustrated, alone in an extremely bad lightning storm. You need to find a way to protect yourself because you are in a really bad situation. And then all of a sudden, a magical creature spawns into existence, granting you a way to protect yourself. It says to you this, I will give you a choice of three cages to protect yourself. Lightning will strike all of the cages. If you select the correct cage, you will live, but if you select the wrong cage, you will unfortunately die. By the way, to relieve you, the odds of you dying from a lightning strike is 1 in 89,930. The first cage, cage 1, is made out of metal. The second cage, cage 2, is made out of rubber. And the third cage, cage 3, is made out of glass. To understand which is the correct cage, let's take a trip back to chemistry and physics class and investigate what happens when you rub silk on glass. By the way, silk is made from spiders. Let's observe what happens on the atomic level. Matter, or stuff, is made out of tiny particles called atoms. Atoms contain a nucleus which is in the center, surrounded by a cloud of electrons. Inside the nucleus are protons and neutrons. Protons are positively charged and neutrons do not have a charge. Electrons are extremely small and have a negative charge on them. But wait, what is charge? Let's rewind time for a brief moment. Back to the year around 600, it was known by the Greeks that if you rub amber, it attracts dry leaves. People will not fully understand this idea until Benjamin Franklin makes his appearance in the 1700s. Benjamin Franklin called this phenomenon electric fire. You obtain this electric fire by the transfer of electric fluid. He also introduced the idea of positive and negative charges. If you have too much of the fire, you are positively charged, and if you have a deficiency of the electrical fire, you are negatively charged. We would appreciate him a lot more if he chose the opposite, but who's complaining? A lot of people, actually. Keep in mind that the theory of electricity was developed long before people had knowledge of atoms. We have the luxury of knowing what atoms are presently. Now let's fast forward our clocks back to the 21st century. We know that electrons are the important things in contributing to electrical charge. If an object has an excess of electrons, it is negatively charged. And if it has a deficiency of electrons, meaning that it has more protons than electrons, it is positively charged. There are two types of this electric fire, plus and minus. Same types of fire repel, plus repels plus and minus repels minus. Opposite fires attract. Let's explore this electric fire additionally. We can transfer this electric fluid by friction. Going back to amber, some materials like to gain electrons and some materials like to give up electrons. When you rub balloons on your hair, electrons travel from your hair to the balloon. Therefore, your hair is positively charged due to the deficiency of electrons and the balloon is negatively charged because the balloon has gained electrons. And this is the whole idea behind the law of conservation of charge. Charge cannot be created. If you create plus, you automatically cause minus charge to be created. There are two types of materials, insulators and conductors. Electric fire cannot transfer easily inside insulators. This is because the electrons are bound to individual atoms and they are not free to move. Insulators are poor conductors of electricity. Usually insulators are non-metals. Objects like glass, wood, plastic, and the famous rubber does not conduct electricity. It can just very poorly. Electrons are not bound to individual atoms and conductors, therefore they are able to move freely. Conductors include, but are not limited to, metals, like steel and aluminum and silver and gold and even salt water. The human body is also a good conductor. Do you know why? You guessed it, because we are made out of salt water. Now let's discuss the methods of charging. As we observe in the silk and glass and amber and leaves, insulators can be charged by friction. Not conductors, because the charges move way too much inside the conductor. We can charge conductors by contact, called conduction. If I bring a neutral sphere near a charged conductor and I decide to touch them together, the charge should be used throughout both spheres to charge a share. This is not the case for insulating materials. Let's discuss another method called induction, charging without contact. If I bring a charged positive sphere near a neutral sphere without touching it, the negative charges, the electrons, move towards the sides of the sphere because negative charges attract positive charges. Positive charges repel positive charges, so the positive charge will stay furthest away. 
one side of the neutral sphere will become negatively charged and the other side of the neutral sphere will become positively charged, but the sphere itself is still neutral. This is called polarization. Now I am going to touch the sphere. As I touch the sphere, electrons will travel from my body to the sphere to rid away the positive charges on that sphere. The sphere is now negative. This is called grounding. Grounding is the process of removing charge by providing a conductive pathway between conductors. Electrons can flow away from the conductor, and electrons can flow towards the conductor. Now let's make charge quantitative. Electric charge is measured in a unit called the Coulomb. One charge on an electron is called the elementary charge with a value of negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. One Coulomb is about 6.24 quintillion electrons. A Coulomb is a large amount of charge. For example, the amount of charge in a lightning strike is about 15 Coulomb. Charles Coulomb was a great French physicist who did lots of work in this area, hence the unit Coulomb. Remember how I said light charges repel and opposites attract? Well, that's because of the phenomenon we call the electrostatic force. Going back to amber and leaves, when you rub amber with something like cloth, amber likes to take away electrons and obtains a negative charge. When dry leaves are brought near it, positive charges will be nearest to the ends of the leaves while the negative charges will move away, causing a charge separation, a dipole. This is called polarization. Imagine we have two point charges in space. In physics, we usually use the letter Q to represent a charge. These charges are at a distance or away. Let's assume both charges are positive. In that case, charges will repel and there is a force pointing outward out of each of the charge. The electrostatic force is responsible for the objects repelling. This force is directly proportional to the charges meaning the more charge you have, the more force that you have, and the less charge that you have, the less force that you have. This force is also indirectly proportional to the distance away from each other by 1 over r squared, meaning that the force will decrease exponentially as the distance increases, and the force will increase exponentially as the distance decreases. Putting this all together, we can calculate the electrostatic force. The K is called Coulomb's constant, which is basically just a number with units attached to it to make sure all of the units work out. Purely for historical reasons alone, sometimes we write for Coulomb's constant 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, where pi and epsilon 0 are again just constants, just numbers. Now I would like you to recall from Newton's second law that acceleration is directly proportional to the net force acting on an object. The electrostatic force causes the objects to accelerate. How do charged objects feel a force? Well, the presence of an electric field enables a charged object to feel a force. The electric field is just a property of space that allows a charged object to feel a force because of the presence of something we call a source charge. Imagine we have a closed conducting sphere and I put a charge on the surface of the sphere. What would be the electric field on the inside of the charged sphere? Since the distance from a charge when dealing with a sphere remains constant because it is a sphere, the electric field is constant. Now we can completely drop the integral, because the integral of dA is just the area of the sphere. So we get to fall in for the electric field for the inside of the sphere. But there is no charge inside the sphere. Why is there no charge inside the sphere? It is unlikely that the charge ends up on the inside because like charges repel each other, so the charges will spread outwards. The conductor is also in something we call electrostatic equilibrium. Charges provide forces for each other. The charges will continue to arrange themselves such in a way that they no longer move until their acceleration is zero. For this to happen, the charges will spread on the surface of the closed conductor, killing any force on the inside of the conductor. Since there is no force inside the conductor, there could be no electric field inside the conductor, hence the equation. This is called electrostatic shielding. Inside closed conductors, charges arrange themselves on the surface outside the conductor such that there is no charge inside the conductors and no electric field inside the conductors, protecting the insides from electrostatic and electromagnetic influences. These closed conductors are called Faraday cages, invented and discovered by the great physicist Michael Faraday. Now you know the answer to the problem. Tell the magical creature I picked the metal cage because it is a Faraday cage and now I know physics.